I'd like you to turn to 1 John, if you will. We're studying the principles of biblical interpretation. Last week, we studied the concept of letterism, literal and figurative language. It pointed out that you can get in an awful lot of trouble when you become a letterist, which is to take something absolutely literal, just the way it is, word for word. When you do that, you create tremendous problems for yourself when you ignore figurative language. Let me illustrate what I mean by this. It's very clear that Jesus said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. It also says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. It also says if you eat this bread and drink his blood, you have eternal life. The Roman Catholic Church takes this in a letterist sense. Absolutely, just exactly the way it is. So when you go to the Mass, you are actually eating flesh. You are actually drinking blood. And you are doing it literally under the appearance of bread and wine. That is letterism. That's taking it far beyond the sense of the passage. Because in John chapter 6, Jesus said, verses 34 and 35, he that, come, he that believes in me shall never be hungry, and he that believes in me shall never be thirsty. All right, it's obvious from his opening remarks that to believe in him and to come to him is to eat and drink spiritual food. No doubt about it whatsoever. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. However you want to read it, it's saying that it's a spiritual concept. No doubt about that at all. It gets even more spiritual when later on in John 6, his disciples and apostles, some of them, say to him, this is very difficult. How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? That was cannibalism forbidden by Moses' law. And these are Orthodox Jews. So they're worried. What are you talking about? Jesus answers, They are spirit, and they are life. The flesh is profitable for nothing. Translation. Why are you trying to make what I say the direct opposite of what I mean? What I mean is, come to me and believe in me. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. You eat my flesh and drink my blood means that you are spiritually participating in me. Because nothing's closer to you than flesh and blood. The disciples got the message. Some didn't, and they walked away. But he said, the words that I speak are spirit. They are life. Nobody understands the Lord's Supper fully. You couldn't unless you were God. But one thing is certain. It's far beyond the symbol, and it's not to be taken absolutely in a letterist sense. Totally, literally. Spiritually, Jesus Christ is present at the Lord's Supper. When you eat the bread and drink the wine or the grape juice, you are participating in Calvary in a metaphysical, mystical sense. That's very clear. But it's not saying that you have literal flesh and literal blood that you are eating. That would be letterism. I gave another illustration of letterism from the 91st Psalm, where I pointed out that the Mormons constantly say that God has a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man. He's a big man. How do they get to that? Because he says he has an eye, he says he has ears, he says he has a nose, he says he has a mouth. So if he's got eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands, and feet, well, in a letterist sense, he's a man. I said if you go to Psalm 91, verse 4, you'll also find out that he's a chicken. Because it says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. He's no more a man than he is a chicken. This is figurative language. If you take it in the letterist sense, then you are destroying the meaning of the passage. Now that is figurative language, 
very important because you must look for it when you are interpreting the scriptures. Otherwise, you can end up in the error of the Mormons or the opposite error, which we're going to discuss this morning. I hear a copy of Science and Health with Key to the Scripture by Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Christian Science Cult. And I have chosen to discuss biblical interpretation in the light of the cults to show you how each of these things is fiercely practical. You can find it on your doorstep. You can find it in literature. You can find it on television. You can find it on radio. Something very literal, something very close that you can't possibly miss. Now, in 1 John, the Scripture says that there is a doctrine of Antichrist. Little children, 1 John, chapter 2, it is the last time. Verse 18, you have heard that Antichrist will come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would no doubt have stayed with us, but they went out that it might be made clear they were not all of us. What is the doctrine of Antichrist? Verse 22, who is a liar, but he that denies Jesus is the Christ. He is an antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Now, the doctrine of antichrist, clear-cut, is a denial of the incarnation, that Jesus Christ is eternal God and that he entered the world as a man. Antichrist denies this. All the cults deny this. Non-Christian religions deny this. They are all opposed and therefore whether they are aware of it or not, are on the side of the Antichrist. So the scripture says, Who is a liar but he that denies Jesus is the Christ? The anointed one. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So you deny who Jesus is, you deny the Father as well as the Son. Very clear-cut statement. Now, Mary Baker Eddy says, in Science and Health with Key to the Scripture, that Jesus is not the Christ. It's a direct quote. Jesus, as material manhood, is not the Christ. Now that is the doctrine of Antichrist. Mrs. Eddy had a particular world view. This was her world view. There is nothing materially real. That is an illusion in the mind. What is real is mind or spirit. And so Mrs. Eddy's favorite statement, called the scientific statement of being, was this. There is no life, truth, intelligence, or substance in matter. But all is infinite mind, and it's infinite manifestation, for God is all and in all. That's Christian science. Her worldview was that the material world, from the most gigantic star in the celestial galaxies to the tiniest bacteria or virus didn't exist except as an illusion in the mind the material world wasn't there the only reality was the invisible mind and spirit world Mrs. Eddy perceived now this is the basic structure of Christian science and of Hinduism from which Mrs. Eddy derived her basic thoughts though she didn't know it all right now figurative language and I have to give you this background on Mrs. Eddy before we go into it. Figurative language is when you are describing a truth in language which is not to be taken literal. Wings and feathers, loaf of bread, I am living water, things of this nature. You don't get yourself all revved up on that and take it actually literally the way it is. Well, the reverse of this, and this is what Mrs. Eddy does, is to turn the picture around so that you take literal language and make it figurative language. And you don't tell the people you're doing it. And how did she manage that? Well, at the end of her book called Science and Health, she has a glossary of terms. This glossary of terms is a little dictionary that interprets what the Bible means for Christian scientists. And you can't possibly understand Christian science unless you look at Mrs. Eddy's glossary first. 
Most people read through the book first. They shouldn't. They should turn in the book to the glossary of terms. And there they would find the opposite error of what we have been talking about. The person who takes everything literally, or as a letterist, and ignores figurative language, goes into error. The person who makes everything figurative and refuses to recognize literal language also goes into error. Let me explain just how it's done. In the Bible it says in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And it also says, you keep reading, that God created man in his own image and his own likeness. So man is a direct creation of God, and his name was Adam. Now, here is the next fallacy of biblical interpretation. This is refusing to recognize literal language and turning everything around so it's figurative. Through the looking glass with Alice and the March Hare, who is mad. Listen carefully. Definition. Adam. Error. A falsity. The belief in original sin. An obstruction to thought. Adam. Adam. Now you're sitting here saying, no, you really didn't say that. Yes, you really did say that. Adam is no longer a material person in a garden. He is an obstruction to thought. It's obvious from Genesis that God created him from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils a living soul. He came into existence as a human being. Very clear. No, says Mrs. Eddy. Adam is really an obstruction to thought, error, a falsity, a curse, a belief in intelligent matter, finiteness and mortality, dust to dust, red sandstone, nothingness. Who is Adam, says Mrs. Eddy? The first god of mythology. Now, if you're reading through Mrs. Eddy discussing creation, and you see the word Adam, you say to yourself, well, obviously, Mrs. Eddy recognizes the historicity of Adam. No, she doesn't. Nor does Christian science. Nor do the mind science cults. Instead, they look right at a literal statement, a fact, and they give it a figurative meaning. Let me show you how it progresses from bad to worse. Angels, according to the Bible, are ministering spirits. Psalm 103. Angels are creations of God and are spiritual beings. Now, let's look at the literal angels transferred by figurative language. Angels. God's thoughts passing to man, counteracting all evil, sensuality, and mortality, the inspiration of goodness and purity. Angels are no longer spiritual entities that communicate for God. They have themselves become merely thoughts. The ark, you always thought, was a large barge in which God put animals. You were mistaken. By taking the literal word ark and giving it a figurative meaning, ark becomes safety. The idea or reflection of truth proved to be as immortal as its principle. God and man coexistent and eternal. That's what the ark is. God and man coexistent and eternal. You might have thought the Tower of Babel was actually a tower. You were mistaken. <laughs> Babel is self-destroying error, a kingdom divided against itself. The higher false knowledge build, builds on the basis of evidence obtained from the five corporeal senses. You've got to listen to this carefully. This is a masterpiece of twisting. The higher false knowledge builds on the basis of evidence obtained from the five corporeal senses. Touch, smell, taste. The more confusion ensues and the more certain is the downfall of its structure. So, you can't really believe there was a Tower of Babel. Figuratively, it re represents self-destroying error, a kingdom divided against itself. 
Baptism, which you always thought was either sprinkle, pour, or immerse, is purification by spirit or submergence in the spirit. Benjamin, who used to be known as Jacob's son, literally, is a physical belief as to life, substance, and mind. Canaan, which you always thought was a land that God gave the Jews, it's going to really upset the Israelites if they read this, actually is a sensuous belief. And Canaan, the son of Ham, is a testimony of what is termed material sense. Children, you always thought, came about by natural conception. Not so. Children are spiritual thoughts. I like to have her tell that to somebody in labor. <laughs> the funny story about Mrs. Eddy, when she was having her metaphysical Bible Institute, which she founded in Massachusetts, Mrs. Eddy was telling everybody that uh, they shouldn't worry about breach births in one of her lectures because a breach birth really didn't exist except in the mind. And so one of the ladies said, but Mrs. Eddy, what do we do if we encounter a breach birth? Mrs. Eddy said, in Christian science, there are no breach births. And the lady said, but what if we have one? Mrs. Eddy said, send for a doctor immediately. You see, Mrs. Eddy was no fool. She knew she could be prosecuted for practicing medicine without a license. And they closed her metaphysical institute shortly thereafter. The dean of her college was, um, turned out to be a phony doctor that she had brought in. When one of Mrs. Eddy's church members presented herself pregnant to Mrs. Eddy, she claimed that she had had no intercourse with anyone but that she had conceived the child by spiritual thoughts of life, truth, and love. Mrs. Eddy became outraged at having her book quoted to her relative to this conception and banished the woman from the church. It later turned out that she had conceived the child in the back of a liquor store. But Mrs. Eddy was smart enough to know that children are not conceived by life, truth, and love and that they are not spiritual thoughts, so she expelled the woman from her church. You may have thought that Dan, who was Jacob's son, was actually a literal person. He wasn't. Dan is animal magnetism. So-called mortal mind controlling mortal mind. What is animal magnetism? Animal magnetism is the devil. Well, that's what Mrs. Eddy called the devil. You may have thought that when somebody died and you went to the funeral, they actually were dead. You were mistaken. Death is an illusion, the lie of life and matter, the unreal, the untrue, and the opposite of life. That's Mrs. Eddy, definition of death. Now, you see what's happening here? I'm doing this. I'm going to great lengths to do this for a reason. I want you to see that the error of turning literal into figurative is just as bad as the reverse. If you don't know the difference, you're in trouble. And when you study hermeneutics or the science or art of biblical interpretation, you have to look very carefully at how people use words. Because if you look the other way for a fraction of a second, particularly in the kingdom of the cults, the occult, and liberal theology, you can end up with exactly this kind of reasoning. And you can send your soul to hell as a result. The devil is not Satan in Mrs. Eddy's theology, not the enemy of our souls, not a massive spiritual being opposed to us, the father of lies. Mrs. Eddy defines him figuratively. Devil, evil, a lie, error, neither corporeality nor mind, the opposite of truth, a belief in sin, sickness, and death. Mrs. Eddy said, there never was a moment in which evil was real, and death is an illusion and the lie of life. On her death certificate at the age of 89, it says bronchial pneumonia. Apparently, the pneumococcus bacillus does not know the difference between a Christian scientist's lungs and yours. It killed her just as quickly as it would kill us. The death rate, as Dr. Barnhouse used to say, is still one per person. And the Christian scientists are making it on a regular basis. I told you once the story about the three men in hell, did I not? I didn't. Some say yes, some say no. I'll tell it again. The Protestant said if I did what the minister told me to do, I wouldn't be in this place. 
The Catholic said, if I did what the priest told me to do, I wouldn't either. And the Christian scientist sat by himself and said, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. That is a very poor use of figurative language. The point in question. Mrs. Eddy's worldview was Hinduism. The material world was an illusion. So it colored everything she wrote biblically. And she changed all the meanings. So literal things became figurative. Now let me show you how dangerous this is. We've been joking about some of it, but this is dangerous. Sin is the unreal and the untrue. It's an illusion. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from the presence of God. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin, says the Bible. This is that he said, the blood of Jesus was no more efficacious to cleanse from sin when it was shed on the accursed tree than it was flowing, when it was flowing in his veins as he went about his father's business. So blood for Mrs. Eddy was an illusion, had no real meaning, and therefore the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross disappears as the payment for sin. Atonement, which is the covering for your sin, she hyphenated into three words. At one meant, which means that you are at one with God because you are literally part of God. When Mrs. Eddy talked of Christ as the great I am and as God, she said, Jesus is not God, but is the Son of God. When she spoke of the virgin birth, she said that a portion of God could not become man in any corporeal sense. So she ended up denying the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the trinity which she called paganism, the authority of the scriptures, and all basic biblical doctrine with one simple interpretational error. With one simple interpretational error violating a simple rule. Mrs. Eddy sent herself and all Christian scientists who believe her to eternal separation from God. That's not fun and games. And that shows you how one interpretational mistake can cost you eternity. Don't talk to me about interpretation isn't important. Not in the light of that. Because in the mind sciences, that's what damns the souls of men. Now, we could hope that Mrs. Eddy repented. We could hope that the mind science people will repent. And I'm not their judge. God is. But if you die denying these doctrines and the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have arrived at it through an interpretational error, which was simple and you could have corrected, it doesn't mean that you're any less lost. That's why hermeneutics, or interpretation, or learning simple rules, can quite literally be the means of saving your soul. Ignoring them can cost you eternal life. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world literally. He was a literal man. He did not take upon himself the nature of angels, says the writer of Hebrews, but of the seed of Abraham. He healed people who were physically ill, lepers, the blind, the deaf, because they had something real wrong with them. And Jesus healed it. Not so when you get into the mind sciences and interpretational error. For the mind science people say, as Mrs. Eddy did, that the sick are not healed by thinking that they are not sick. They are healed by knowing that they're not. Whoopee! That sounds wonderful. The only problem is, it isn't true. And it's based upon this interpretational error. Taking the literal and turning it into the figurative. There's nothing figurative about this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. There's nothing figurative about this. Christ 
died for the ungodly. Nothing figurative about this. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. One interpretational error. And more than 20 million people worldwide in the mind science cults have turned from the narrow way that leads to life eternal to the broad path that leads to eternal spiritual death. Hermeneutics and interpretation are very important. They're the difference between life and death in the Bible. Donald Barnhouse and I sum it up with what he said on this subject. He was a professor and a great teacher and my teacher, and a great intellect. He had the capacity to take vast ideas simple people couldn't understand and reduce them into simple language so that you could understand the most complex thought. That's a great gift. And he had it. And he said, what do people mean when they always say to you, well, that's your interpretation. My interpretation is different. It's only a matter of interpretation. Barnhouse said, the people that talk that way indicate by the way they talk that they have no idea what the word interpret means. Do you want to know literally what the word interpret means? It means to make plain. So when a person says, well, that's your interpretation, they're really saying, that's your making it plainer. I can make it plainer, then you can make it plainer. And so you're up to a little game of what I say is better than what you say. Anything you can do, I can do better. That's not what God intended us to understand. This is what he intended us to understand. That there are basic rules of language which he himself observes. God observes. And if God observes them to communicate to us the priceless message of salvation, then we had better take the time to learn what they are so that we can communicate them to others. That we don't make the same mistakes the cults make, the same mistakes that liberals make, the same mistake that men make when they ignore the simple rules before them. Just as the Mormons can lose their souls by believing Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and their letterism, so that God becomes a literal man. So you can lose your soul if you turn the literal into the figurative and ignore the fact of what God is saying. This is the fact. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. That's literally true. And it is also literally true that God loved us and delivered us from this madness by sending his Son to die in our place. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. and He that will not obey the Son will never see life, but the wrath of God continues to abide upon him. That is literally true. Our Father, Thou hast loved us before time began. Oh, please impress upon our minds this morning how important it is for us to listen to what You say. How important words are because You chose them. How important it is to interpret what You say as You intended it. And not as some cultist, occultist, or enemy of the gospel portrays it. Cleanse us of our sins. Make us fit vessels for thy use. Forgive us the ways in which we have failed thee and help us to learn these things so that we may communicate effectively the truth of thy gospel and of the love of thy Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.